if I did perform to my best abilities all the time, I'd I'd maybe make a career from it. Uh, and and they'd be like, oh, I want to be in that position and you wouldn't fit in and yeah. yeah, you'd not have as many friends and you'd kind of be the outcast. So it's weird. I'm not sure what it's like for you in the tennis space, how in this intricate like subconscious web of thoughts and emotions that then comes out in just dropping my performance mm. to fit in because I'm too scared to just be as good as I possibly can be because I'll just blitz everyone and be alone. You know? Welcome. Welcome to another episode of Going Pro. And today we are here with Oliver Zafaridis and he is the founder of Deep in Motion and you're passionate about movement. You're a movement coach. You are working to connect the physical and mental side of uh, performance and the body. Uh, you have played with Adelaide United Youth Team and you were there for three years. And in your second year there, you won MVP. And you transitioned from there to then play uh, in the senior leagues as in the MPL here in Adelaide at a professional level here. So it's a top league as a soccer player here in Adelaide. You've had setbacks, as we all have, but uh, from being MVP, you were dropped from Adelaide United and that was kind of a bit of like a shattering moment for you as a young aspiring pro. But then um, you've then won MB MVP yourself at Raiders, uh, Croatian Raiders. You've played for Metro Stars. You've played for teams in Victoria. And um, over the years, you've just been passionate about performance. Uh, I've known you for a long time. Uh, you're someone that I always turn to in terms of just someone that does the one percenters. You're, you've always on top, been on top of your nutrition. Uh, I guess everything in terms of like nootropics, supplementation. You, you've been the guy that I've been asking questions from and you've helped me with my performance on the tennis space. So I'm really keen to dive into that. You've got your cert three and four in fitness. Uh, you're going into your fifth year studying and learning from mentor Joseph, who has created Fighting Monkey, which is uh, the FM practice is developed by founders Joseph and his wife Linda. And through a deep study of cross, cross motion analysis and with the aim of understanding principles of human movement, communication and the aging process, which works perfect for you. Uh, and that's led for you in 2022 to create your own business through Deep in Motion. So you've, you've hung up the boots. You, you've decided that you're going in a different direction. And uh, you're now creating a business, business, doing what you're passionate about to really help people um, with their body, with just like feeling more joy, feeling better about themselves, um, leave, I guess, past stories behind and, and, and create better ones um, with love, uh, with the aim to love life more. So um we're super stoked to have you here first of all thank you for joining us stoked to be here <laughs> and fantastic so uh, i uh, i really want to dive into what it was like at adelaide united so that time there you you got the call up to play in the youth team how, how did that look and then what was your training schedule like um can you paint us a picture of that time at adelaide united back then mm. First of all as well, dude, we've spoken about a podcast for so long, so it's so nice to be here on the other end of it with you starting this and just to chat about whether it's my stuff or your stuff and work and life on all parts of the spectrum is a pleasure. So yeah, it's been yeah a big story and roller coaster, but to paint that picture like you asked of what it was like back at Adelaide United, there was... It was an up and down process getting like into the youth team and that selection even happened from having some really good trials and like performing well under pressure but then in the selection process getting told that I wasn't selected and then I only got into the youth team initially because a player got offered a train on contract mm -hmm. which is that you get a spot in the squad to train on not an official contract and you're not guaranteed to play any games you just train with the team if injuries happen or if someone's underperforming there might be a chance to play but you're just training and a player not sure who exactly it was at the time actually turned it down so i was the next option 
and it was a yes straight away. Mm-hmm. I don't think you could turn down saying yeah no to Adelaide United youth team at the time. I think I was maybe seventeen. Yeah. So yeah, then it was there. It was maybe three, three and a half years of that. The first year or just over was yeah training. No games, not getting selected in teams, but being out there four or five days a week. And it really varied. Some days or cycles of the season or off-season, we were training afternoons. So I think I was in year 11 when it first started and year 12. And it would be get home at 3.15, have a small bite and leave by 3.30 or 3.45 to get to training. No homework (laughs) was getting done (laughs) and getting back at like... 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, eating yeah. dinner and maybe doing some PE that I was passionate about, but not chemistry, not maths. <laughs> Just focusing on that stuff. Full team athlete vibes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that whole process was from training and being kind of less of a favourite, it felt like, from the coaches and then just building that over time slowly to then being a stronger theme in the youth team leading into the next year. Yeah. But then there was also, that was one of the pivotal moments where I had been there for just over a year now, part of the squad, and two weeks before they were handing out the youth team contracts, I had the my position as left back, and a player got selected over me like within a couple of weeks of the season starting. So once again, even though I hadn't played or done much for like a year besides train with the team, I also had another setback and I was just a train on player again. Yeah, okay. Um, So that was like, that was tough. After doing so much and so long and you're not doing as much homework or, you know, surpassing expectations in school because it's all soccer, you're in like the pole position and right at the last minute, someone else took my spot. Um, and then from there, the team had pretty bad form and lost the first five games of the season. And then they made a few changes to the lineup because they just needed to change things up. So I got given opportunity. And it was actually, you wouldn't believe it, the same weekend as schoolies. Okay. <laughs> so it was actually the one time I didn't want to get selected in the squad that I got selected, of course. Yep. Bit of a test. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was away in Canberra. So it wasn't like, oh, I'll play the game in Adelaide and then I'm still here for schoolies with my high school mates. It was away in Canberra. We played AIS. And in the first half, I got an assist. Mm-hmm. Played really well. Probably one of the best games I've had ever played leading at till that age. And then from there, we won. They kept the squad because us players that kind of got given the opportunity just pounced at it and took it. Yeah. And that was like the moment. Then the season was 18 games. So I didn't play the first five and I played 13 games straight, 90 minutes every game. And that was the season I got best and fairest. And okay. I didn't have an official youth team contract as well. Okay. So right. that was that season. Leading up to that first game, is, is it pretty much <coughs> like your, you know the magnitude of that moment that you just have to perform? Like, how do you deliver in that moment um, looking back? What was that that all about? That was, yeah, had all of that intertwined with it. And that was something that for me as a player, I actually always struggled with. I always struggled with pressure or I wouldn't have played as good on grand final day, whether it was school soccer or club soccer. I had little moments in, you know, bigger games, whether it was cup or whatever. But this was the first time in that environment, traveling, you're playing against the Australian Institute of Sport. So it's also, you're playing against the best 16 players at a youth level in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it just kind of happened. I just, you know, you've done enough. Maybe it was because I had been a train on for close to getting to like a year and a half or so. Yeah. Well, there was literally no other option. The AIS team was a little bit younger, which also at the time gave me a bit of confidence where it was just like, oh, okay, even though they're the best for their age, they're a touch younger than us. Um, But then a couple of like a tennis game, whether it's first set or the first couple service games, if you start good or you have a good warm up or a good hit, you just, it's like, oh, okay, I'm on today. I don't have to stress about it. Mm -hmm. We're on and it's working. 
and then it just builds momentum from there. Yeah. yeah. Whereas maybe if you didn't start as good, do you feel like that affected your your performance? Like if you had a shocking yeah. start, it was like, okay, nah, the whole match is going <laughs> to be rubbish. Yeah, and that was a theme for me. I remember growing up where even if I had a bad warm-up, it was like, oh man, it's not happening today. Like I had, I had no ability to have a mistake in the first five minutes and just move on from it, realize it was a mistake and play really well. Yeah. That used to, yeah define a lot of my game didn't happen often but when it did happen you could tell and I wasn't myself I was like in a bit of a shell it had been continuous work to move away from that and that confidence and spending time like in Adelaide United so you feel like you're kind of like making it and doing something good with your career and you're on the cusp of like making a dream a reality so there's a bit of confidence in that um, and yeah, from having a good warm up, a good first few moments, some bigger tackles and things that aren't my greatest traits, but came off. It was like, oh, something that I'm not normally good at just came off. So like, it must be, it must be my day kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then to get an assist early with a good cross, which is crossing was one of my like best traits. It was like, oh, like I've done something. Yeah. I've influenced, had an assist, even if I play the rest of the game bad, that's actually pretty good to kind of keep my spot as long as we win you know yeah yeah. Yeah. this is just a quick note on our podcast sponsor this podcast would not be possible without the support from 4rt they are a creative house that helps businesses with their advertising marketing and content needs if your business has a story to tell then these guys can really help you with that story and through ata they've helped us massively and we trust these guys dearly and we feel like they're the best in the business so they could add a lot of value to your marketing and advertising needs I guess from there, you ride the wave of the season. How do you continually back up performance? Are you just like riding that wave and just feeling like you're invincible? Because I know that there's pockets sometimes when you're in, you're in a form and you just feel like you could do anything. I know I've, yeah. I've had that in moments in tennis. You just feel like you just know you're going to win or you know you're going to play well. Yeah. Is that kind of what it was like? How did you keep it going all season? Mm, that is definitely what it felt like with just getting on a roll And over the years, I've always given credit to the teammates that I had because we had an incredible team that year. So the players that were alongside me in defense made my job super easy. And if I made a mistake, it almost went under the radar because a couple of the players that were next to me would just mop it up. And they're actually currently still playing A-League at the moment and have been called up to Socceroos and made their careers from it so I don't think it would have been the same if I didn't have the teammates I had around me that I could say were more gifted but Mm -hmm. I ended up there in that position and took the opportunity and then from there I just remember that year that every game moving forwards felt like a flow state and felt like each week somehow managed to get better managed to have maybe one or two less mistakes And whether it was an A-League player that dropped down in the youth team that I was then playing against, it didn't matter who it was. Every week felt easier. Every week week felt better. Uh, And it just built and built right up until the last game of the season. Yeah. I mean, you just touched on um, the flow state there. I Mm. think that's, that's that's a state that we all know of and we can catch glimpses of in certain activities or sports or different arenas. Looking back, was there anything that you can contribute to why you found that state more often? Mm. Is there anything you can pinpoint on, on how we can almost like stumble across, across and be in that state of being? Yeah. Sometimes I think back and I just, even after playing local league for then five or six years after that, it was like, how did I get in that place for like 13 weeks in a row? Yeah. It was like every game was literally, I would just click into it. Yeah. And it was like I I got out of the way of mm. my own mind, the doubts, or the fake confident, like trying to boost myself up kind of superficially. Um, and yeah, all of a sudden, it was just like a calmness. And like you touched on, I've been big on the one percenters and things like that over the years. So there was just a trust where it was just like, I've done all the stuff. And once I got one good game or two good games and the coach is getting around you a little bit more, 
it was just like, oh, plus the teammates around me. Yeah. It's like, man, this is easy. We've got this. It's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is an important topic to touch on. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by getting out of your own, own way? Because I feel like there's some, there's some gold that I think now with where you're at, you understand mm. the kind of mechanics behind what that is. Yeah. But can you explain what you mean by getting out of your own way to 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 bring forth that that gold in yeah. in those matches? Yeah, I think, and it's literally perfect for any person. And obviously, like we us working together, you and me, it's great in the tennis space because, like I said, I had teammates, and tennis is alone, so probably even more important. And like you know, we do have those tendencies to really get in our head about things and start to have a little doubt or get caught in a mistake, whether it's a missed pass or an unforced error or a double fault. And we really let those moments that really just pass us and are a few minutes earlier stay in our mind where all of a sudden it's like, oh God, I don't want that to happen again or I'm going to get roasted by my coach or my parents on the side or my auntie's here to watch and what, what are they going to tell me that I'm not good or okay, yeah, so yeah little... Us, telling yourself a story there. <laughs> telling ourselves a big story. Yeah. So that was a big part of it. So it was just a practice of knowing when you've done as much as you can that you can just go, I've trained every day this week or I've done all my sessions. As long as you're giving 100% all the time, come game day or match day, you know I've done everything within my control. And from there, if I make a mistake, okay, but it won't happen again. It's like a rare occasion. And even if I miss two passes in a row, it's like, oh, wow, that never happens. The third one will work. Yeah. And then even if you miss a third pass, it's like, pfft. I never miss that three times in a row. The fourth one will work. Yeah, yeah. And you try and just go back to that trust. Yeah, unwavering trust in yeah. yourself. I mean, and that's, that speaks to Steph Curry. Just he wants the ball, man. Like yeah. he, he might he might miss five threes in a row, but my goodness, he wants that ball in his hands and he's yeah. going to be taking the shot because the sixth one's going in. And if the sixth one's not going in, the seventh, one's, seventh is going in. Exactly. And he just backs himself every single time. And yeah. I think that's – I think – when it comes down to performing and doing great under pressure, I think that's the unwavering trust you got to have, but it's got to be backed by the work that you've done behind yeah. the scenes. And yeah, you were training hard and the work was paying off in those moments. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's exactly that. And some players kind of can go a certain amount of time without that. Um, but the players that do, in the end, it does pay off. And then if you have also the natural talent and gifts plus that, then that's a, a recipe for success for sure. Oof. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, get, that gets me excited. When I see someone that does the work and has talent, wow. Yeah. Uh, I am um, trying to nurture that yeah. in, in, a, in a student because they have the capabilities to go very, very far if, if that's what's happening. Yeah. So you've played amazing You've got MVP like in the youth team where you have A-League players dropping in to the league and uh, you're around a bunch of guns as well and, and you, you win MVP off 13 games where you miss the first five games of the season, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you don't get offered a contract. So talk me through what happened there and were you shattered at the time? Like, how was that for you? Because you were only young, like you mm. probably like 18, 19 at the time. Yeah, I think it was 18 turning 19. It was yeah. something like that. So, yeah, well, from that season, we rolled into, it was the first, we were the first youth team that got entered to play in the local league. So, the MPL, which I then played in after with other teams. So, Adelaide United became a team that played all year round in the local league during the winter season and in the Youth National League during the summer. And from there, that was like difficult because now it's like you're not playing against youth team players. Now you're playing all year against men. Mm. So that was challenging as well. And that was a good year. And we had like a dramatic finish to the season. We started in the second league because we couldn't just get gifted playing into the 
top league. So we had to win promotion and earn it. And we won and earned promotion on the last day, like in dying minutes. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. And then from there, we went into the next National Youth League, which was roughly October to February or March. And went through that season. We Our youth team, again, really similar core group of players. We got into the Youth League Grand Final that season. Played in Central Coast. It was on Foxtel. Had all of everything to it. In the change rooms, you're traveling like a dream. We lost that final. But then when we got back from there, that was when it kind of unfolded. Where I was like, okay, we're 20 years old. On the cusp of turning 21. You're either getting... A senior team contract or you go like back to the local league and you have to have a, a standout season, perform really well, get noticed and then maybe an, a new A-league mm-hmm. opportunity comes up. Interstate, in Adelaide, overseas, you're trying to make something happen. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, how did you find out that you, you didn't make it and did that really affect you mentally at that point? Because you were riding a lot on soccer at the time, like... You weren't studying really hard. You were really just taking it super seriously to be a pro athlete. So how did you handle that and how did you move forward through that setback? Mm, that was <laughs> How it happened was interesting. I had a meeting with the Adelaide United senior team coach. And in terms of it's funny where life takes you and timing and direction because the year that we got to the Youth League Grand Final, Adelaide United actually won the A-League as well. So then we get to the end of our contracts and there was a bunch of boys that I can still put my hand up to this day were more talented and were unbelievable players that could play professionally as well. And I had a meeting with the Adelaide United senior team coach to say, is there a future here? I've had a couple good seasons. I got youth team MVP. Um, and from there, what, what is next? And we also had a big changeover in the assistant coach and official coach of the youth team. So there was a change in coaches for our youth team. I had this meeting with the A-League professional team coach for Adelaide United. And my youth team coach said that, oh, the senior coach doesn't see a future for you at Adelaide United. So I'm not going to offer you a contract. And then I had a meeting with the senior team coach and we sat down and he was like, oh, well, I've got the list for the youth team here and the coach, the new coach that taken over, that's taken over actually hasn't put your name in it. So you haven't actually been selected like in the youth team to stay a part of Adelaide United. I was like, but wait, so I've had these seasons with the youth team and I've actually not been selected. And But he's telling me you're not seeing a future for me and now you're telling me that he just hasn't yeah. selected me. So it was yeah, strange. a whole... A roller coaster process in itself to then come to the conclusion, walking out of that meeting, going, okay, probably the senior team didn't want me, and also the new youth team coach doesn't want me as well as like an older, slightly older age player. So I guess it's the local league. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. So from there, like uh, transitioning, establishing yourself in the NPL, you played what, 150 games? I think, yeah, just crept over that 150 mark. There's someone, I forget his name, that keeps stats and it was like around around that mark, yeah. Yeah, okay. So how did how did you transition um, through that time? What, what, how did your game change over time in the MPL and then like lead you to, to a point where you got best and fairest at Raiders? Mm, that's, yeah, it's looking back at it all. It takes you back down memory lane for sure because you come out of the youth team and you're in the local league and being a young kid, you're just in the headspace of, oh, I was at Adelaide United for like three, three and a half years. This will be easy, you know. And then you are in a different team that, are yes, they're men, but they're not as technical because they haven't been in that typical, whether it's state soccer or Adelaide United youth team soccer where it's like, Barcelona, tiki-taka, possession, beautiful football and it's just rough as guts and it's men and you've been playing just against like 18, 19 year olds your own age for three years now. So the first couple years were uncomfortable and a struggle and I was like out of teams and coming off the bench but then having a good patch and then losing confidence and being on the bench and really in and out with 
no consistency and you're just thinking, wow, this is way harder than I thought. Yeah. There is there is like nothing happening with soccer at the moment if it keeps going like this. Yeah, <laughs> it's a harsh reality. Yeah, okay. Um, one thing that like I really have known you as that I touched on before is you've always done the one percenters. So through that time, how, how did you prepare for games? Um, what were some of the one percenters that you were doing, I guess, like physically or get, uh, or I guess with like nutrition or supplementation, what was, what was some of these things that you, you were implementing to help your game um, or to help you perform mm-hmm. on match day? Yeah, that was, that's probably been a journey even now, like we know and you know with me for my health, probably a journey for the last seven or eight years or so now in total, whether it's nutrition and diet and lifestyle and we speak about like the emotional components of things and supplements and all of that and I found, started to find a really good rhythm, started to go towards that like paleo keto was strong back in the day but i was hearing podcasts and studies of doing it still in a way that supports you for like peak athletic performance so you're not just like low carb and flat on energy and you can't perform still or build good muscle and little things like that can you can you tell me a little bit on the rationale as to what why you decided to do that like what what, mm. what was why why that at the time and yeah, what was the rationale behind it for performance yeah so i it was actually towards the end of adelaide united where i started to change nutrition and i had gone from a pasta boy and having burgers and whatever it was fries and shakes before games and stuff like that to carb load And then it was a nutrition assignment where then one of my chiropractor kinesiologists, Dave Perotti from Premium Health, who's been a mentor for years, passed me a book that was on fat as fuel in regards to keto and the health benefits from it, the athletic benefits from it, from lasting performance and using fat as a more efficient fuel source. So I read some books listened to some podcasts and it said that fat as a fuel source can last longer. We can store more of it. So if we learn to be in ketosis and burning fat as a fuel, if we get efficient at burning fat as a fuel, and like most people say, they try to go healthy and they have an energy dip for like two, three weeks and they feel like garbage. Once the body kicks into ketosis where you're burning fat as the main fuel, Paired with training, I was going along the lines of if I can burn and utilize that fat as a fuel from food or body stored fat to higher percentages of intensity, whether it was like 85% intensity, maybe 90%, then I can use that. And then the glycogen or the carb stores that I've got from bits of sweet potato and things like that, I I can spare them for the really high intensity moments or the moments late in the game. And I can go through a game predominantly using fat as the fuel. So I still have some stores to last longer rather than just needing sugar, needing glucose, having snakes, having Gatorade, like every 15, 20, 30 minutes a sip to last and you burn through it and then you need more and you burn through it. It's like, oh, I could eat in a way and have a sustainable fuel source and use the good carbs for those high intensity bursts to recover quicker to last longer in a game because i won't be using them in those intensities from like 70 percent to 85 90 percent yeah wow okay so did you feel a tangible difference like when did you start feeling a difference and how did it affect your performance Mm, i think initially like most do, I probably, as I was learning and testing it on myself, went too strict yep. and I felt a little bit weaker on the ball, not as strong. Energy was okay, but it wasn't changing my game completely for probably like a year and a bit or a couple years. That was the couple like harder years transitioning from the youth team into MPL. Then... I started to kind of relax into it a bit more, knowing, okay, I can have good quality food. I can have good sources of protein, good vegetables, good salads, good fats. 
and the night before a game, the morning of, I can still do the traditional like carb load. But rather than it being like pizza, pasta, burger, chips, I can do that with rice and sweet potato and quinoa and have eggs with some sweet potato and like a bit of baby spinach in the morning and still actually carb load. And from there, I felt a noticeable difference at training when I started to like refeed with good carbs at night after training, good protein still, good fats. And I started to feel, yeah, stronger more energy lasting better and with that comes like you know on court as well better decision making yes better um concentration and having all of the good qualities we want last longer throughout games under pressure all of that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah that's amazing i think that's something a lot of athletes don't take super seriously and yeah, I, f- I, it's, I feel like it's a massive pillar. It's a massive pillar that we're underutilizing uh, in terms of nutrition. And, and yeah, I, I feel like we've got a long way to go in terms of figuring out what's going to work for us and doing more research and, and really just trying to get quality food, not just like thinking about certain calories or mm. I just need to get numbers in. It's, it's more about what, it, what actually quality food is going into your system and how is that going to help with also the other things that you touched on, like decision making and, and the mental side of performance? Yeah, definitely. And it was a fine line and a balance. And then there was supplements, whether it was minerals and magnesium or, you know, needing sugar, but rather than having Gatorade that has all artificial stuff yes. and a big list of things that aren't as beneficial you can have good sources of glucose mixed in with water and salt for minerals and Mm -hmm. you can really do which yeah like you said is unfortunately rare as longevity is a part of what i do you can be a top performing athlete and carb load and have doses of good sugar and good fats and these energy sources that don't destroy your gut or destroy your health or your joints or your mood or your mind and actually just have it last for a quality of game and performance with longevity and health in mind as well yeah yeah amazing i I think this is something that's really of value for anyone that wants to take their performance to a new level what would you really recommend as just top-notch supplementation um, minerals you touched on what would you recommend to people that you think will actually make a difference to any performance in any discipline? Mm. Well, to make it clear, I have to say the classic thing that don't take this as medical advice. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm just a bloke on the street. Yeah, on the street. In my cert four, I can give nutritional advice yeah. <laughs> for people that trust me like yourself maybe, but... Yeah, so don't go and take this and then come after me for something. But the good staples that I know made a huge difference for me was a good mineral source, whether that was always a pinch of like a good rock salt or Himalayan salt in my water bottles. Okay, can you? I want to touch on why that actually helps if you have something to share on that. Yeah. With all these things, why they actually are going to help. Mm-hmm. In performance. Yeah, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. <laughs> Not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Not a doctor. Um, but all of those trace minerals, whether it's magnesium, whether it's potassium, whether it's sodium, really help with us being going into how our hormones produce and how we have electrical impulses in the body for our muscles, for our nervous system, for all of that to fire as rapidly and efficiently as possible over extended periods of time that's what those things are crucial for Mm. whether it's hormonally for energy uh, mood regulation focus clarity decision making all of those things yeah our soils aren't as good like they used to be back in the day so just the foods we're eating i think even if it is for just general life but especially sports performance at an elite level the foods we're eating aren't enough anymore so I'm like you, all for natural things and not taking too many things and just doing the basics well. But there are certain things like minerals and stuff like that that we need help with, especially for peak performance 
sweating, all of that kind of stuff where we get depleted for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other recommendations? You, you, you talked about pinch of salt. Is there any other ones that you feel are important before we move on? Yeah, one that I know we've both done pretty well over the years was I got onto essential amino acids. Yep. So I started to hear about that a lot and that whether it was fatigue or cramping or the mental clarity, all of those things, that muscle fatigue could actually come from a lack of essential amino acids in the bloodstream, which are kind of like the building blocks for muscles and all of those processes to like fire efficiently, last longer. So rather than needing just sugar to last longer in a game or anything like that, Essential amino acids became a big part of my little mix. And my mix was essential amino acids, a really good pinch of salt, and then for the glucose, but rather than having a bottle of Gatorade or Powerade, I would do rice malt syrup or honey is a good variation. The rice malt syrup is just glucose, so it does absorb a bit quicker. And I would shake a bottle of that mixed together and that was that everyone knew me for that was my game day drink with a bottle of water just plain with salt which i think helped a lot over the years for sure Mm. and covered most of the bases yeah i actually clearly feel the different one difference when i'm taking amino acids uh during and before matches so when i'm taking i feel like i i don't cramp I feel alive in my legs. I feel like sometimes when I haven't had it in the past and it might be a hot day, I can get a little bit jelly-like in the legs. Mm. And when I'm having amino acids, I I definitely feel like that's not happening as much. Again, so many variables, but um, more true than untrue for me personally. Yeah, and I think we've both experienced that together and just confirms the things that we've both heard or or read by once again people that are tapping into this health industry but also mixing it with sports performance mm-hmm. um is kind of yes yeah, slowly and hopefully like we touched on changing how we can approach yeah nutritional guidance and athletic development and performance in a healthy way without just thrashing people with like lollies and sugar and artificial this and numbers and that um there's a really good way to go about it for sure yeah for sure there's a really scientific way to go about it that i that just elevates performance and i just find it fascinating i'm I'm always looking for just these little things just to get get an edge and yeah I, i love trialing an error um using just different supplements and, and and figuring out what works for me. Would there, would there be any would there be any supplements or just anything anything general that you would not recommend um, for people to stay away from that is going to maybe hinder performance mm. um, on match day? Yeah, there's not too many that come to mind straight away. Once again. There's all the lollies and the snakes and things like that that I found really common in the change rooms before sport, during sport. So those I know if had too early, you do within anywhere from 30 to 70 minutes, anywhere in that range, depending on the person, get a dip in blood glucose and energy and you come off that high. So if you're having that stuff like before the game or in the warm-up, midway through the first half or midway through the first set of tennis or early in the second set, you kind of come off this high and be in an energy crash in the pivotal moments of the game. So that was always one. I avoided having yeah too much sugar and sticking to the more satiating, sustainable like carbs in the morning. Then there's the broader subject that we both value highly of just like really good hydration, really good salt, really good sleep. But in terms of avoiding things, even if it is the Gatorades, the lollies, things like that, you can you can get away with it for a certain period of time. But that definitely comes with the detriment of some crashes or I wouldn't go have a huge bowl of pasta and steak at 11.30 before a game at 1 o'clock. So I'm not sure if that's completely too basic knowledge that most know or some people are having two bowls of pasta at Nonna's before game day. 
<laughs> I'm just imagining going to Nonnas <laughs> yeah. and then trying to play a tennis yeah. match after that. Wow, we that not, would be you're disastrous. Not, you're not going to be light on your feet. No. So, yeah, to sum that up, to avoid it would be too much sugar too soon before a game. Heavier meals. I know some people say they feel good on it, but I definitely think a lighter meal so the stomach isn't working to digest heaps of food. So you can go out feeling good with a bit of an energy source, but knowing it's not like, oh, I'm a bit heavy and sluggish or I'm going to have a crash in 30, 40 minutes. And it's like, oh, I feel light. I feel nourished and I'm ready to go and last a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anything that held you back? At, at at that pro level, that looking back, that you know, or you would maybe change or do differently. Mm. There was definitely a lot, and I that like you know, am more of an emotional, like sensitive person. So there's been heaps that I've had to work through over the years of soccer, and some of the themes that held me back were. That and it's, I think it would be a really common thing with athletes that want to go to the next level and stand and stand out was the thing. And there was like a fear of standing out that would come out in like this self sabotaging performance way. Because in primary school, I maybe similar for you, I was the best soccer player and it wasn't a soccer school, and then in high school. We didn't have heaps of soccer players, so you kind of stand out again as like the soccer player. And then you go and you're just trying to make friends and fit in. And I know over the years you've mentioned the tennis space is really clicky. So it's like, oh, well, if I am so in the zone and performing so well at my peak, I'll have no friends. (laughs) So that was a pattern that came up for me, whether it was for speed or strength or certain traits or whatever it was, one thing was, which I just got help with and guidance with over the years, was that kind of dimming my performance in a way so that I was kind of respected and understood and could fit in with the team and laugh with the boys because if I did perform to my best abilities all the time, I'd I'd maybe make a career from it. Uh, and and they'd be like, oh, I want to be in that position and you wouldn't fit in. And yeah. yeah, you'd not have as many friends and you'd kind of be the outcast. So it's weird. I'm not sure what it's like for you in the tennis space, how in this intricate like subconscious web of thoughts and emotions that then comes out in just dropping my performance mm. to fit in because I'm too scared to just be as good as I possibly can be because I'll just blitz everyone and be alone, you know? Yeah. It's really really interesting how some of the subconscious actually affects performance that we don't really know. And you actually got to do some internal digging to figure, figure out why some of these things are affecting performance. And I guess that's why it's changing, but I, I, I guess that's why it's important that we seek help and seek guidance through mentors or maybe some sort of sports psychiatrist or counselor for example to actually get to the crux of why am i not performing if you do want to go in that direction to perform better and feel like it doesn't make you any weaker it doesn't make you less of a person it's okay to admit that we something's wrong because we're all flawed we're all flawed humans in some way we have beautiful elements that we want to I guess, foster and nurture. But there are, there are elements that hold us back that if we can tap into, we can actually improve performance greatly. Yeah, definitely to all of that. And I think it's each person, each player is completely unique and has different traits and different weaknesses and strengths. So just working through and understanding, which I know you tap into when I was had that time at ATA on court coaching together with, with you, we can kind of bring that bit of awareness to players and myself to people that I coach or work with or then myself as a player is just bringing awareness to that stuff to know, oh, I can just, just do 
completely and everything that I know I can do and just let it go from there, which comes back to that unwavering trust that, yes, I'm different and there's other players that do these things, but if I have a gut feeling or I know I want to do things in a certain way or play a certain way, just really go for that. Like fortune favors the brave. Yeah. I know you've used that in tennis heaps, which really sums it all up perfectly. Yeah, for sure. You definitely need to be brave and it doesn't come naturally at times. And you just you just got to almost tell yourself and ignite that fire in yourself to, to be brave in the pressure moments. Because you know the alternative. You know that if you play it safe and you go all defensive, it, it doesn't work out. It's it's only going to work out against um, a weak opponent. Or, but that that's not that's not going to count when you're playing in a pressure moment against a good player in tennis context. That they're, they're going to go out and and win, and you have to be able to win on your own terms in in those moments. Yeah. It's super important, um, but it takes it takes practice. Yeah, and. This is something that I'm, I'm super passionate about. Like I, I needed some of these tools growing up. Um, sim- similar to you, definitely sensitive. Didn't have any guidance around the mental side of the game. And um, yeah, I've through the journey, I've had great mentors that have helped me to manage some of these situations uh, that have helped me on and off the court. And that's uh, that's what I'm passionate about bringing forward to to others because i just see that there's a there's a big hole with kids growing up not having these tools is is that something that really ignites your fire as to why you do what you do to to really give back to to help kids or just anyone you work with to have some of these tools to to navigate some of the complexities of life that we that we face yeah for sure that's kind of at the crux and passion of what I do and what I want to share with more people because we know that mental health and all of these topics are becoming a big thing or gaining popularity over the last few years and there's so many different ways to go about it but then even whether it's for life or us bringing it back to sport for me whether it's working when we're doing the warm-ups at ATA and bringing in concepts or whether it's any of the people that I work with, bringing for me, for them to have a deeper understanding of who they are. And I think it's because I am continuously practicing it for myself. Similar to you, we're both similar in that space. It's like, oh, I know this feels incredible to do what I love to follow my passions whether it's sport whether it's work business life relationships and so much freedom comes from that which is going back to being brave and owning who we are uniquely so sharing that and helping people just kind of highlight a few of the things and guiding them in a way to just know it's okay to be whoever you are in whatever unique way it is just brings a weight off the shoulders and a sense of freedom and a smile on your face and from there even if not initially it's just back to trusting that if i do this being completely myself only the best will happen for me and that might be going and being more aggressive on court because if you make a mistake or if you lose you're not any less of a person or it's not failure it's just it didn't quite work out and you can really go for it in any area of life yeah you don't want to define yourself by who you are on the soccer field or the tennis court that that's that's not healthy there's so much more to you than that yeah and i guess you're talking about trying to figure out who you are or be who you are for a lot of people who are young or um i guess don't have life experience how how do we how do we figure that out like just be who you are but i don't know who who i am like Mm. is it does it come from just trying things like how do we get a a sense of like what is true for us and what isn't true Mm. yeah i think Like we both know, it really does come from experiences. And I think just from observing from the outside that 
tennis is a really intense lens into those things. And because you're there alone, different to many other sports, it's an incredible way to experience what you're like under pressure or when you're losing, which we always speak about is so different to me in that soccer space surrounded by a team. I can make a mistake. We can still win. So I kind of don't feel as bad about myself or whatever it is. So I think it's having, you know, the right people around us, family, friends, coaches, mentors. Then it just has to be experience, playing on court, training, and kind of just having people around us that can help us catch ourselves out when we get down and we get low on confidence and like you do well. And what I like to do is inquiring and asking them a question of why do you feel down about yourself or what are the thoughts going through your head? I think especially for kids, I'm sure it's the same for adults. If you give them the space and the right questions, the answers will come up for them. And then it's just time and trusting in that practice. Yeah, that that's a really big one. Uh, empowering other people to find the solution for themselves rather than revealing and telling them the answer is, I think, really, really important. To be able to give them the empowerment to figure it out is just... <clears throat> <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> Very good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just feel like they're, they're learning it for themselves actually for themselves yeah. like, uh, it's not secondhand through through my words it's yeah. them realizing it for themselves and they have it and they, they have know it, with it. it yeah they really know it and then yeah. when it comes down to it i guess like a pressure moment mm. or or a challenging situation they can actually draw on some of these moments that they had when they actually started to figure it out yeah because they revealed the answer to themselves yeah so yeah i feel like self-inquiry with the help of someone who's like a guide mm. is paramount. Exactly. I think so. And once again, so it's clear, it's not like we're asking them a question and then there's like no support or like go figure it out for yourself. You're alone kind of thing. It's like, no, we are here. If you need to ask something back, ask away. Maybe you do know though. So we'll start with asking the question. Yeah, it's it's like... um. Having some having training wheels on, mm. it's like you're riding your yeah. bike. I'm, I'm daddy, daddy, <laughs> just like just helping out, pushing the bike. But then I let them go, and then yeah. all of a sudden, they're riding, daddy, I'm riding the bike. I've got this, I've got yeah. this. And then they fall over. It's like I pick them up, and then yeah. we're back on again. And slowly, the training wheels come off, and, and they're becoming self sufficient individuals mm. that can figure out things for themselves because that's what I want to be part of is yeah. giving people the tools to come up with their own solutions so that when they hit the age of like 15, 16 onwards, they can actually handle themselves and have a sense of who they are and, um, yeah, really navigate the world yeah. with some tools, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I think, like, if we yeah bring it back to the greatest athletes, whether we mentioned Steph Curry or Djokovic now is going to another level. There's Serena Williams over the years or whoever these athletes are, Michael Jordan. There's, you know, that they've experienced things. They've had all the set by, the setbacks, but it's not viewing that as, yeah, bad or good. It's just a new experience. You understand yourself a little bit more and when the time comes and you, you can just continuously go for it and you know it'll be all sweet. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure, I I really wanna I really wanna dive into injuries, bro. Mm. Yeah, I really really wanna dive into injuries. I mean, I just see it time and time again in the tennis space, and not just tennis space. So many different sports where it's like injury only focused on the source of the injury. Let's just take some rest, couple recorrective exercises no inquiry into why that injury might be happening and let's just chill out for a moment everything's going to be sweet and let's just get back business as usual mm. with with no actually trying to figure out the crux of it no trying to figure out what are the movement patterns contributing to the injury itself and it's just a groundhog day that the 
process just goes in a loop and um, we never really, I guess, solve some of these issues. So that's my observation. Curious to know if that's similar, what it was like for you in the soccer space Mm -hmm. and what are some of the common injuries you see and and why why do you think some of these common injuries uh, are occurring? Yeah, what a rabbit hole we could go down here because I feel like there is so much. We're in an age of information and there's so much out there, but simultaneously I don't see, maybe I'm not exposed to it, but I haven't seen the rate of injuries decrease. So it's like there's something wrong where we have strength and conditioning coaches and people that have got a master's of this or a degree in this and the injuries are still increasing and happening with no contact from yeah imbalances in the body or movement patterns over the years. So it's a it's a very like broad and big topic that's hard to narrow down and then to touch on for me through yeah, even that you introduced me to Joseph and Linda through Fighting Monkey and the basis of that being coordination and rhythm as the really strong pillars. So even as simple as possible, what I believe is that if the body has rhythm and is well coordinated, besides a bit of impact in sport, there's things you can't avoid sometimes with good rhythm, with good coordination through the whole structure, you really decrease your chances for injury moving forwards. And there's never a complete guarantee, but we can really do our best in some yet different thoughts of thinking and moving and preparing our bodies for sport and longevity that can really, I think the this field is very ready and on the cusp of a paradigm shift towards this kind of stuff. Yeah, not in the days of like linear training and we just do, you know, deadlifts and bench press and I actually did deadlifts this morning, funnily enough, but <laughs> those linear ways and it's always the same and there's no articulation or rhythm and the body's isolated and I'm a tennis player so I work my shoulder and I do something for the shoulder but it's not connected to my hips and how my spine is connected from my shoulder to my hips and how that relates to how my foot pivots Mm. and lands on the ground which influences where my knee is in proportion to my foot and my hip and it's this chain reaction through the whole structure. So there's a lot to kind of change and and shift, which we can talk about in different points now. Yeah, there definitely needs to be a paradigm shift. Um, uh, Rhythm and coordination, I think, is essential. And and, and the people that have it naturally, you see that they're just moving so silky around the court or on the field. And I just feel like naturally they move well and they're not getting injured as much. Mm. They also get injured because they're overusing and they're not, they're almost like abusing mm-hmm. how, how mm-hmm. gifted they are in how they move. But I feel like when people have rhythm, things are working in more in harmony. And, and you talked about just like not having an understanding of how things connect. We, we, we isolate everything. Mm-hmm. If we can start to develop a relationship of how everything connects from, especially especially in tennis, from the feet to the hip. Mm. So tennis is heavily um, focused on footwork. If, yeah. if, if you're moving well from the feet uh, and really getting yourself in good, good positions, then you can strike very well um, consistently. Yeah. And then if you have an understanding of how to use the feet into the hips, then that relates into rotation and the spine starts to move better and then that can explode into more force through the shoulder and out through the hand. Mm -hmm. And I guess no one really that I've come across has taken it seriously to understand that process Mm -hmm. to go, how does it biomechanically actually need to move through the body to strike an efficient object, to strike the uh, object efficiently? Yeah. I think if we can start to tap into that more first of all you're going to decrease injuries and you're going to move better you're going to feel better on court 
I've had moments where I feel very rhythmical and it feels like a one nice flow when I'm in that space. Um, and I feel like you're just going to have a lot more joy out there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I know that we use the, like the word flow comes up again, which I think is another word for rhythm as well, almost like a synonym and coordination. And especially in sport, in this field of injuries, we speak about movement patterns over so many years from a young age where if we have ease in the body and we bring this rhythm to our whole body, the body wants to find an equilibrium and a balance and kind of a center point. So that does just working on rhythm and coordinating the whole body. It does slowly over time kind of unwind the structure from movement patterns and we start to open up in different ways and with, yeah, certain practices or coaches and people we can work with, we can kind of let go of tension in the shoulder to have a really effortless swing and have lighter footwork and understanding the leg so it can be springy. And with this ease and rhythm, everything becomes more efficient and through efficiency, we can then have better intensity more easily for longer periods of time throughout a game, whether it's a 90-minute soccer game or a three, four-hour tennis match. So there's many different areas, but like you said, understanding that lightness in the feet, coordinating it through the legs, through the hip, and rotating, I think rotation and coordinating the whole structure is the biggest piece that athletes are missing mm. that I've seen in the soccer space or the tennis space or any sports, even for just adults that have desk jobs or whatever it is, mm. that slow burn of overworking things, isolating things, kind of you hit a wall and you have almost nowhere left to go until the same pattern continues to occur. Yeah. yeah. I want to get down to practical things. So, so where, where do people start, I guess, practically with some movement tools or I guess movement snacks that yeah. they can kind of chew on yeah. that will, will, will maybe help decrease the chance of injury and, and start that process for anyone that might be interested? Yeah, I guess we've got, we've both got a long list of things that is beautiful and we see the benefits of the the athletes that are exposed to it. We are human, so we stand on our feet. So I think we can we can still foam roll and get a massage when we need some treatment and stretch a little bit and do all of these things. But in terms of injuries, injury prevention, rehabilitation, having some movement snacks to do, I definitely strongly believe, and this is inspired from Fighting Monkey and learning from Joseph, who's a mentor to both of us, that being on our feet because we are humans, we walk, we are athletes, and that should be predominantly where we kind of check in and try to open up the hips or just give the knees a little dose of variation so it's not just knees outside of the toes, a little bit of single leg balance for a bit of proprioception and allowing the whole structure to wobble a little bit. Um, just trying to rotate and let the arms loose and look behind us because we often just are square. We try and have stiff, nice posture and we stand up tall. So little things like this that are done on the feet because your range of motion through your hip is going to be completely different when you're doing maybe a Cossack squat standing compared to when the physio is just doing some hip adduction and you're lying on your back on the physio table. Yep. That's not relevant to how you do like a sliding backhand on court at break point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I think starting to develop a relationship with how you use your feet while standing yeah. can change everything and uh folks there's no magic pill unfortunately this is a lengthy process my goodness sorry it to is, break it to yeah, you yeah my lord this has been what five years i think it's coming up to five, five ish something man. like that yeah 
the the changes in my body are just can't even put into words. Just yeah. incredible changes. In, if there in were if time. there were a few things that you could say that were maybe more relevant to a feeling you have on core, what would they be from that philosophy of working on the feet and bringing in some diversity to the body? What do you mean, sorry? So from the concepts that we talk about of, yeah, yeah doing movements on the feet, moving well, having rhythm, and it being four or five years now, what are some of the kind of biggest differences you've found as a feeling when on court now? Uh, very free in my hips, mm. for sure. Um, it's, especially in the last probably one, probably in the last year, the feeling of how to actually use the feet, how to spring, how the, the work of the Achilles, the pumping of the heel, these are ideas that like have been ideas, but now I can actually feel how it works and I can feel it working and I can feel how it's shaping my calf more. Like it's not like I'm doing crazy workouts at the gym. I just do a lot of maintenance work and I can see how my body's actually changing through the anatomy of how I use my feet mm -hmm. through the big toe and then how that translates into springiness. I feel a lot more alive yeah. on, the, on the court. I feel like I can do it for a long time too. Yeah. Whereas in the past, I could maybe only do it for um, for a short time. But I felt in the past, it was more a top-down approach, like heavily focused on like just shoulders and yeah. arms and not enough from the ground from the ground up where I really move my feet well, very alive through the ankles, not kind of dead and flat with my feet. Yeah. Pumping up, really starting to get elastic with um, the hips. And I feel like I've got a lot of range of motion where I can slide full length and play a ball on both sides. Mm. Um, and that comes from just being open in the hips yeah. and feeling free to then rotate uh, as well on the stretch as well. So um, lo it's taken a long time, Yeah, but I also feel like I recover a lot better too. Mm. Like I, I, I'm coaching a lot of hours. I'm training a lot still going to the gym um and i'm i'm able able to back it up pretty yeah. consistently i've got a pretty heavy workload mm -hmm. and the players that i'm hitting with and training with like they all a lot of them play good tennis so i'm yeah. having to move it's not like i'm just standing there just like feeding balls or with, with a with a bucket hat just like getting roasted by the sun like yeah I, i'm moving i'm yeah. moving out there and I, I feel good and i feel alive and i just feel a sharp increase in energy yeah this is a great point i think because with this approach to whether it's labeling it as injury prevention or then we have match play and athletic development and then we have what we do for recovery and we have all of these isolated components of, well, I have to do my injury pre prevention work, then I have to do my stuff around training and then I have to fit in time for my recovery but this concept of coordination and rhythm and, yeah, livening up the feet, feeling the Achilles, feeling the ball of the foot and absorbing force, creating force like a pump through the legs, giving some rotation and squeezing and diversity to the joints. All of this is simultaneously doing injury prevention improving performance and because the joints and your whole structure moves better you're less sore yeah. and you're increasing recovery time at the same time all in one not that we're looking for efficiently but it's a beautiful byproduct of moving well which is very underrated and not really spoken about as doing this form of training to improve gameplay and also decrease and speed up our recovery time because i remember that i've always mentioned over the years my last two three years of soccer it's not that i wasn't playing at 100 percent match intensity but i would wake up the next day and besides like the first game of pre-season where it's like the first competitive game that you've played in four or five months i would never have soreness the next day and it was just because movement was efficient mm. there was rhythm so there wasn't as much shock and pounding on the joints with that rigidity and joints being restricted so taking in more force and that could just disperse through the whole structure to just 
be soft and let it spread evenly to wake up the next day with less damage to the body. Yeah. You're, you're speaking to something that people will just go, you, you, you're talking smack. Like you're talking, <laughs> yeah. you, you are absolutely lying right now. But it, it's, it's it's true, man. And it's possible. And it's pe- possible. People just have this belief that, oh, yeah, I'm going to be sore. And, my, and by the age of 50 and 60, my hips are just going to be absolutely done. Yeah. And I'm going to need knee replacement. And I feel like this is a bit of a story and a bit of a lie that we've told to ourselves. And it's it's not necessarily something that that, that we have to buy into. Yeah. There is solutions and you can do it, but it's a longer road. But the, the results <laughs> are long lasting. You're going to have them. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you're going to know that the process on how you did it and you're actually going to have an understanding of how the body works. And um, that's going to be a game changer for you. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's, unfortunately for people, it is the path that we both know maybe initially does take more time and energy. But whether it's for longevity in a spor- in a sporting career, to last on court, we look at all the athletes, whether it's Michael Jordan, whether it's Federer, Djokovic is still going, the ones that they look like they just dance on court so elegantly that is coordination and rhythm like at its peak and they're really tapping into it i've always said over the years i can't wait to for roger federer to come out with like the complete recipe or what of what he did over the years to move so elegantly and there's the mental stuff as well but you really see these people it's just like wow they look like they dance on court. They just have this elegance about them. Michael Jordan could jump high, absorb force softly, spring away, change direction, pivot. And it was just literally watching a choreographed dance. So this topic we're talking about, even though it sounds completely confusing and so different and yet yeah, all of these things that might be hard to grasp, if there's just little doses of doing things on our feet, trying to incorporate the whole structure, feeling how things connect from the leg to the knee to the hip, just experimenting with little things. Once you get past that initial phase where it's just like, oh, it's taking energy and it does initially, it takes work. Otherwise, everyone would do it. Yeah, You really start to see, mm-hmm. yeah, the benefits start to come along over the years like we are both starting to tap into now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I could talk about this stuff for, for hours with you, man. It definitely lights me up. Um, f- from this conversation, I'm just hearing hearing your absolute passion for just longevity, your, your passion to really dig into the internal and emotional space to help others, the, um, the passion to have more joy in life and that it's possible that you can and feel a lot of freedom through the body and how you move and how you coordinate yourself. Um, where does this all lead for you, man? Like, where do you see yourself in the in the future, and and what's the vision moving forward as far as you can see right now? What a question! <laughs> oh, there's so many avenues. Um, I definitely know that there's a big feeling to just help as many people as possible to share these gifts because I know that since me being back to different topics we've spoken about being uniquely myself which still comes and goes there's times where there's little fears and oh maybe if i do this it might be a little bit different to what everyone else is doing that's always there and at deeper levels showing up but the freedom the joy and the love that has come from doing what i love and sharing that with people is just like yourself doing what we love man undeniable so being able to share these tools with as many people as possible is what I feel called to do and continue to share right now. I'd love in the future to yeah continue to work with sporting teams and athletes so we can slowly change that space and that approach um, to travel and explore and experience so I understand who I am and can meet new people. Um yeah, to spread this through Adelaide and South Australia so it can continue to evolve and be really new and open in this in this place because 
like we both know, man, yeah, people are in those old stories still of we have to work hard and we have to work a certain amount of hours and being tired is normal. And yeah, I love my, I love certain things, but like I do this most days though, or it's just like, no, we can, we can love it all and have it all and do it all. And it's just time for a new story to be shared in that space. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing you, bro. Amen. 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 <laughs> uh, for anyone that's, for anyone that's just maybe struck a chord for, where, where can they maybe reach out to you and find a little bit more information? How good is that? So, when I started last year and I called my business, even though it's just me, Oliver, I called it Deep in Motion. So, deepinmotion.com is my website. Deep in Motion on Instagram. I have my own page, Oliver Zafaridis, and there's a slight difference in things that I share, but mainly through Instagram and the website. And there's blogs, there's poetry, then there's performance stuff and training and what group classes and certain offerings um, in many different ranges for different people or teams or organizations or whatever it is. Yeah, there's a little rabbit hole people can go down. Amazing, amazing. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. Appreciate you coming down. Appreciate you as a brother as well. And uh, yeah, look forward to the next one. I appreciate you as a brother as well, man. What a journey. Look forward to the next one.